This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled MDS Prognosis, Understanding IPSS and IPSR Scores. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lee Clark, Patient Educator at the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to thank Celgene and Takeda for providing educational grants and the generous support of our patients, families, caregivers for providing support for this webinar program. Today's presenter is Dr. Ryan Madison. Dr. Madison is an assistant professor of medicine within the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He received his medical degree at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine, completed his internship uh, medical residency at the University of North Carolina Hospitals where he served as the chief resident. He recently completed his fellowship in hematology oncology at the University of Chicago. His clinical interests are in the care of patients with hematological, hematological malignancies, particularly acute lymphocyte, lymphoblastic leukemia and acute myeloid leukemia. He is interested in the drug development to improve care and outcomes for patients. He is also a member of the American Society of Hematology and American Society of Clinical Oncology. It is my pleasure to welcome you today, and thank you very much for your, your presentation. Thank you, Lee. This is Ryan Madison. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to proceed. Super. So thank you for this opportunity uh, today, and I'm looking forward to sharing um, thoughts about MDS prognosis, particularly as it relates to understanding the IPSS and revised IPSS scores that are important for risk uh, stratification and to help decide on treatment. So my objectives today are to review the historic understanding of myelodysplastic syndrome, or MDS. Uh, by doing so, I'm going to shed some light on some of the names, the nomenclature of the different diseases. Um, I'm also going to review the differences between high-risk and low-risk MDS. I'm going to do that by way of discussing both the International Prognostic Scoring System and the revised International Prognostic Scoring Systems in MDS as they determine prognosis. And then finally, I'm going to talk some about uh, gene mutations and how it's, under, uh, how it's uh, helped our understanding of MDS prognosis, um, how the diseases work, and how to uh, recommend different treatment options based on those gene mutations that are found at diagnosis. So this slide here shows uh, normal hematopoiesis, or a, a diagram of what happens in the bone marrow. This is a uh, early hematopoietic progenitor cell, and then they mature into the common myeloid and common lymphoid progenitors. I'm going to spend most of my day today talking about the CMP, or the common myeloid progenitors. Uh, this is important because these progenitor cells then develop into cells that are important uh, for bone marrow and blood function. So the erythrocyte, the megakaryocyte, and the granulocytes are going to be something I'm going to be talking quite a bit about here in a little bit. So myelodysplastic syndromes are a clonal hematopoietic stem cell disease. It's a disease of early progenitor cells in the bone marrow where they stop functioning properly. Clinically, this is important because patients can develop a number of different uh, clinical features. Some will develop low red cell count, and so they'll become anemic. Red cells are important for carrying oxygen. Some patients will develop a low white blood cell count, which impacts their ability to fight infections. And then some patients will develop low platelet counts, and that can uh, cause uh, excess bleeding um, that can be life-threatening in some cases. The name myelodysplastic syndrome comes from dysplasia, which is an abnormal appearance in one or more cell precursors in the bone marrow. And ultimately, it's a disease of ineffective hematopoiesis, uh, so the blood-forming system is not working properly. 
MDS occurs about 13,000 new cases per year in the United States. Um, some patients, but not all, have an increased incidence of acute myeloid leukemia. However, I want to stress that even if patients don't develop AML, uh, they can still have clinically important uh, consequences from their bone marrow failure uh, syndrome. Again, these can include bleeding, infections, and then patients who are uh, de transfusion dependent can develop iron overload for multiple packed red blood cell transfusions. The main development, uh, the main risk factors to develop MDS include age. So the median onset for MDS is age 70. Um, there's a slight uh, gender imbalance, uh, males 1.8 to about uh, one per female to male ratio. Different things that people can be exposed to in their um, medical history, including prior chemotherapy for other cancers, prior radiation for other cancers, as well as tobacco, agricultural chemicals, and industrial solvents have all been associated with the development of myelodysplastic syndrome. Again, the primary clinical features for MDS include low blood counts. So um, anemia predominates, the red cell counts low. It's usually what's called a macrocytic anemia. So the red blood cells, uh, when they're measured by the machine in the lab, are actually large, and that uh, is indicated by this MCV, or mean cellular volume. Um, platelets can be low. Patients can have what's called thrombocytopenia. And then the white cell can also be low, or leukopenia. Patients may have one, two, or three of any of these features. They're actually often found incidentally in patients uh, who have had lab work done for other reasons uh, through their healthcare uh, provider. The clinical evaluation, if MDS is suspected, is one has to have a few other testing items done uh, to rule out myelodysplastic syndrome. This includes uh, checking vitamin B12 and folate levels, as well as copper. Um, viral testing for viral hepatitis and HIV are important. Uh, a patient's alcohol use history can also be important, as alcohol can have a direct toxic effect on the bone marrow that can mimic myelodysplastic syndrome. And then we can also check for lead and arsenic uh, levels in the blood to see if a patient's being exposed uh, to these uh, items. Part of the evaluation for uh, evaluation of myelodysplastic syndrome includes a bone marrow aspirin and biopsy. Um, from that sample, we have the pathologist look at it under the microscope, and we also send it to the cytogenetics lab that can look at chromosome analysis as well as molecular diagnostics, which is being done more and more uh, as part of MDS evaluation. Next, I want to talk a little bit about um, the historic understanding of MDS, and this gets into some of the terminology that we still use despite a different understanding of what MDS is. Uh, this comes from a nice review by David Steensma that was published in 2011. And it was first called in the early 1900s pseudoaplastic anemia, uh, where it was an interesting finding that the peripheral blood counts were low, but looking at the bone marrow under the microscope showed more cells than one should suspect to have. In 1923, it was termed de Guglielmo's syndrome, where the red blood cells looked abnormal under the microscope and patients had anemia. And in 1938, the term refractory anemia was first used by Rhodes and Barker, and vitamin B12 deficiency had been recognized recently before that, um, and refractory anemia occurred when patients were given vitamin B12 supplements but still didn't have a response in their red cell count. So that's where the term refractory anemia comes into play. Moving into the late 1940s, the term pre-leukemic anemia was coined by Hamilton and Patterson. They published an observation that refractory anemia often evolved into acute leukemia. And then in 1953, there was a case series published in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, that looked at 12 patients over time and saw that there was an increased incidence of leukemia. And it was known as pre-leukemia throughout the 1960s and the 1970s. So thankfully, a group in the early 1980s put together the first classification system for myelodysplastic syndrome, and this is called the French, American, British, or FAB classification. It's still taught, and it's still used in some format. Uh, the term dysmyelopoietic syndrome was then coined into myelodysplastic syndrome, and the blast count, or the number of immature cells in the bone marrow, was found to be important. In 2001, the World Health Organization, or the WHO, lowered the threshold for acute myeloid leukemia to 20% blasts, and uh, deletion 5Q syndrome was first recognized as part of uh, myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, in 2008, the WHO then updated the classification, and then finally, more recently, in 2016, 
uh, the WHO again updated the classification, which I'll go into detail. And this is the classification that pathologists currently use when they're signing out bone marrow biopsies uh, and that we use to make treatment decisions and to determine eligibility for clinical trials. So a little bit about the French-American British classification that was developed in 1982. Uh, it was, again, the first attempt to classify the MDS subtypes. Um, blast count played a major role, so refractory anemia was determined if the blast count was less than 5%. There's a char characteristic red blood cell under the microscope called the ring sideroblast that was first noted um, and determined to be part of this classification, so refractory anemia with ring sideroblasts. Patients who had a higher blast count, which had what's called refractory anemia with excess blasts, or RAEB. And then finally, this categorization where the blasts were between 20 and 30 percent, it was called refractory anemia with excess blast and transformation. These patients would now be classified as having acute myeloid leukemia because their blast count is greater than 20 percent. And finally, within this classification, a term called chronic myelomonocytic leukemia uh, in patients who had a low blast count but still had uh, greater than 1,000 monocytes. And I'll talk a little bit more about this subtype in a bit. 2001, the World Health Organization eliminated the RAEB in transformation and called those cases acute myeloid leukemia. The chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, or CMML, was put into a new category called the myelodysplastic slash myeloproliferative neoplasms, or MDS slash MPN. And then importantly, the deletion 5Q subtype was uh, first isolated. Moving to 2008, some of the terminology that was updated included refractory cytopenias with unilineage dysplasia, refractory anemia with ring sideroblast, refractory cytopenia with multilineage dysplasia, and then finally this RABB, the refractory anemia with excess blast, was broken into two categories, one and two, based on the blast count. Myelodysplastic syndrome with isolated deletion 5Q, and then finally a myelodysplastic syndrome unclassifiable that didn't fit nicely into these other categories. So as you see, it's getting confusing pretty quickly um, about the different subtypes. Um, and so in 2016, key changes came along. The term refractory is really more of a historic term, as I described in the refractory anemia from the 1930s. So that term was removed. And there's an emphasis by the pathologists on looking at cell line morphology rather than the peripheral counts that were low in order to be clearer. Again, this was published by the WHO working group in um, blood in 2016. This is the current uh, terminology that we use now, our pathologists and hematologists working together. You'll see one of these terms on the bone marrow aspirin and biopsy as it's signed out. So MDS with single lineage dysplasia, MDS with ring sideroblasts, either with single lineage or multi-lineage dysplasia, MDS with multi-lineage dysplasia, MDS with excess blasts, MDS with isolated deletion 5Q, and then finally, the, or the MDS unclassifiable. And then finally, there's a group called myeloid neoplasms with germline predisposition, so some of the more recognized inherited syndromes. So that was a lot to cover in a short amount of time. Uh, now I would like to move along to uh, really the, the main topic of today's webinar, and that's prognosis and risk stratification. And we really now use the revised IPSS. Before we talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about the International Prognostic Scoring System that was first developed and published in 1997. So it was first developed again in 1997. Uh, the diagnostic criteria that were used for this uh, were based on the French, American, British classification. That was the one that was published in 1982. Um, at the time that the IPSS, excuse me, at the time the IPSS was developed, there had been six separate systems that were developed and published, so there's a lot of different systems out there, and not everyone was speaking the same language. And so uh, the group led by Greenberg and published in 97 looked at 816 patients from previous, seven previously reported studies, and they looked at different clinical features uh, of the, their MDS, and they looked at outcomes, and they came up with the International Prognostic Scoring System. This group determined that things like cytogenetic abnormalities, blast percentage, and rather whether there was one, two, or three cytopenias were found to be important. They then used these um, features in a multivariate analysis to create a model that predicts both progression to acute myeloid leukemia, so what percentage of patients progress to AML, as well as predicting median survival in patients with um, newly diagnosed myelodysplastic syndrome. 
So admittedly, this is a busy slide. Uh, it was published initially by Greenberg in 1997 and then a review by Nimer in 2008 in Blood. Um, but I want to focus on these three items, so marrow blast percentage, karyotype, and cytopenias. And the way the IPSS scoring system works is uh, the clinician looks at the marrow blast and then they assign a score of anywhere between zero and two for blast percentage. They then look at the karyotype, and the karyotype is the type of cytogenetic abnormalities that are seen in the diagnostic bone marrow. Those are categorized as either good risk, intermediate, or poor risk. And then the last component of the IPSS scoring system is whether there's zero or one cytopenias or two or three. And that's defined by a hemoglobin of less than 10, a neutrophil count of less than 1,800, and a platelet count of less than 100,000. These different uh, aspects are then added up to give a total score. And then the investigators assigned either a low, intermediate one, intermediate two, or high risk score uh, based on that total score. And that gives some information in terms of median survival in years. So again, the time in years at which half of patients with that given risk are still alive and which have died, as well as the time for 25% of that category to progress to acute myeloid leukemia. So you can see that the median survival has quite a range, anywhere from greater than five years uh, down to less than half a year, depending on the risk group, uh, as well as the time that 25% or more progressed to acute myeloid leukemia. And again, these are averages. These are, patient, these are um, population-based numbers, and so every individual patient uh, is in a different circumstance. But this gives us a sense of how these risk scoring systems work. This is what's called a uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And in the x-axis, uh, time in years uh, goes from 0 to 18. And then the percentage of patients who are uh, still alive and well goes up here. So you can see the curves vary quite a bit. This is the low-risk curve, intermediate 1, intermediate 2, and high-risk curve. And it, again, gives a visual, um, uh, a visual read about the risk for the different IPSS uh, score and risk. So some of the successes about this first scoring system, it really created the first widely used and reliable scoring system in the treatment of myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, it's relatively simple to calculate based on only three clinical factors. And then it's incorporated patients from a variety of centers. And so that um, just speaks to the broad number of patients who were brought in and analyzed uh, from a number of different centers. However, uh, it's not a perfect system, so some of the weaknesses include that it uses factors at diagnosis only. It doesn't really change. It can only be calculated once. Um, the number of cytogenetic abnormalities is relatively limited, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how that was changed. A follow-up study showed that poor risk cytogenetics were as uh, a high risk factor as high blast count, and so it was probably underweighted in terms of uh, overall scoring and risk. Another important item to, to mention is in 1997, there were very few effective therapies when the system was developed. And so some of the numbers such as survival and progression to a leukemia are changing for the better for patients because of the number of therapies that we now have available to use. And then finally, the presence of cytopenias, but not necessarily how severe they were, were scored. And so I'm gonna show a example of how that's important here. So I've got uh, two contrasting patients in this example. So patient A uh, has an IPSS score of 0 0.5, so relatively low. This person has normal cytogenetics, 4% blast, the hemoglobin's 9. Uh, platelets are actually quite low at 1,000, which, which makes someone at significant risk for bleeding. And the neutrophil counts are 200, and so that puts someone at significant risk for infection. Uh, but because of the way the scoring system was set up, they still have a relatively low score or good risk. Contrast that the patient B, who has a higher score of 2, uh, they have normal cytogenetics as well. The blasts are quite a bit higher, and that's where their uh, increased score comes from. The hemoglobin is the same, but the platelets are much safer at 98,000, and the neutrophils are much safer at 2,400. So I would argue that patient A, even though they have a lower score and a lower risk, they're actually at significant uh, risk of having more clinical problems sometime soon in terms of bleeding and infection. That just gives one example where there's some shortcomings in how this IPSS scoring system works.
So Greenberg and colleagues in 2012 uh, published an update uh, to this IPSS called the Revised IPSS Score. It was developed by the International Working Group for Prognosis in Myelodysplastic Syndrome. And they looked at 7,000 patients in 12 countries, and they refined the prognostic scoring factors to include more cytogenetic subtypes than were originally published, the severity of cytopenias, and they also looked at age, uh, performance status, or how well someone's doing clinically, as well as ferritin, uh, which is a marker of iron overload, and LDH, which is also can be a marker of disease activity. I'm going to spend a few minutes here looking at some of these differences. And so the cytogenetic subtypes were defined into five different, and that includes very good, good, intermediate, poor, and very poor risk. I just want to highlight that the very good included uh, deletion Y and deletion uh, 11Q. And the good risk included the normal cytogenetics, and the very poor risk included complex karyotype where there was greater than three abnormalities present. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here looking at the other subtypes, but um, those are the more important ones. And now looking at this table, again published by Greenberg and colleagues in blood in 2012, there was different scores that were attributed to the different risks. So looking at cytogenetics, bone marrow blast percentage, hemoglobin, platelets, and the absolute neutrophil count uh, were all found to be important, and a score of anywhere between 0 and 4 uh, were attributed to each of these components. The investigators then added them up and then uh, broke them down to either very low, low, intermediate, high, and very high risk, de depending on uh, the total, some of the risk factors. And um, clinical outcomes, looking at the 7,000 patients, about 19% fell into the very low, 38% the low, 20% intermediate, 13% high, and 10% very high. And survival ranged anywhere from 8.8 .8 years uh, to less than a year, depending on the risk uh, stratification. And again, these are population averages, and so they can't necessarily be applied to a specific patient at any given time. This is, again, the Kaplan-Meier curve looking at uh, survival in years and percentage of patients um, still alive and well. And so the very low risk, this dark, thick black line, um, those patients did the best. And then low, intermediate, high, and very high uh, risk based on their scores. And so you can see there's a, a pretty obvious difference in the clinical outcomes based on the revised IPSS score. So. The scoring system is useful. I think it's helpful to, to have this information when talking to patients about the severity of their MDS, but of course, you know, patients, the, the bulk of the conversation is really based on, well, what can we do now? What can we think about next? And so I want to talk some about therapy and treatment goals. Um, certainly, MDS is a curable illness in some patients. Uh, it does require an allogeneic or a bone marrow transplant for appropriate patients. And by appropriate, we look at age, we look at um, overall health, other medical conditions, as well as the uh, availability of a donor. But certainly, that can be part of the conversation for a number of patients uh, with MDS. We also talk about the reduction of transfusion requirements. Uh, so if someone's needing packed red blood cells every one to two weeks, if there's things we can do to help reduce that, that's certainly a welcome intervention. I mentioned the importance of a low platelet count and a low white count uh, for bleeding and infection. If we can raise those, that's going to be helpful. And something that we certainly think is important, but maybe not mean the main focus of treatment, is really delaying the onset of acute myeloid leukemia. And some of our therapies have been shown to be useful at that. But again, most patients don't develop acute myeloid leukemia. We're trying to do what we can to um, reduce the disease burden in these other areas. So next, I'd like to spend a few minutes on a couple of cases, um, and these aren't specific patients, but they kind of bring elements of, of management in from a variety of patients I've seen over the years. So case number one is a 55-year-old man with six months of progressive fatigue. Um, he has a past medical history that's significant for high blood pressure as well as a high cholesterol. On exam, his heart rate's a little high, but his other vital signs are generally normal. Um, he has uh, pale conjunctiva, so the uh, eyes are a little pale. Uh, his overall uh, 
appearance is somewhat pale. Uh, his heart rate's a little high, and he has a soft murmur on exam. Looking at his labs, his white blood cell count is actually in the normal range. Uh, the hemoglobin is quite low, 8.2 grams per deciliter. Anywhere from 14 to 17 is generally considered normal. Platelets are actually high. They're 550,000, so platelets between 160 and 400,000 are generally normal. And then the mean cellular volume, or the MCV, of the red cells is actually elevated. And so uh, the normal range goes up to about 98. This patient is at 115. So he has big red cells um, under the microscope. So this is a uh, peripheral blood smear from this patient, uh, this representative patient. Uh, you can see that the red blood cells appear somewhat large uh, compared to a normal white cell. Uh, they're somewhat misshapen. Rather than having nice, regular, round red cells, uh, there's a variety of sizes and shapes. And um, that's the main feature I wanted to show from this slide. And so a bone marrow biopsy is performed uh, that shows myelodysplastic syndrome with isolated deletion 5Q, again, based on the more recent 2016 WHO criteria. Adding up the clinical features, this patient has a revised IPSS score of 2, which confers low-risk disease based on the good risk cytogenetics and based on a hemoglobin of between 8 and 10. So those each gave him a point. Um, and so actually adapted these slides from a different talk, so I don't think we have the ability to vote uh, online, but uh, therapies that could be considered for this patient are the use of erythropoietin, uh, the use of a drug called lenalidomide, uh, the use of one of the two drugs, azacitabine or decitabine, or a bone marrow transplant. And so I'm actually going to answer the question myself. Um, and by by virtue of looking through the National Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, Network Guidelines for Treatment of Myelodysplastic Syndrome. So these guidelines are useful for clinicians as well as uh, patients and families to talk through what are the options. And so an MDS with a lower intermediate one risk um, we look at anemia as the symptoms predominate. Uh, if that's the case, if the patient is primarily anemic but their platelets and white count are low, uh, then we talk about using either lenalidomide if they have the 5Q deletion or using erythropoietin if their endogenous EPO level is lower than 500, and we measure uh, that in the lab uh, with the patient's blood sample. We know that if a patient's own EPO level is greater than 500, uh, the chances of responding to erythropoietin are fairly low, and so then we think about using azacitidine or decitabine. And then in some patients, they have what's called a hypocellular marrow, so there's fewer cells than expected. Um, or if they have an HLA-DR15 or a PNH clone, some laboratory testing we do routinely, we can consider using immunosuppression with antithymocyte globulin and cyclosporin. So therapies that are more uh, considered for aplastic anemia. Finally, if someone has a low platelet count or a low white count, and even if they have lower intermediate risk disease, we'll think about the drugs azacitidine or decitabine uh, to try to improve those parameters and reduce the risk of complications. This is a slide from a seminal publication published in 2006 uh, by Alan List and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this gives evidence that lenalidomide can be very useful in the 5Q minus syndrome or the MDS with 5Q deletion. Uh, in the study, they treated patients with 10 milligrams daily, uh, either 28 day, 21 days uh, with a seven day break or continuously on a 28 day cycle. There's 148 patients with a 5Q deletion. Of those, 112 had reduced transfusion needs and actually 99 no longer required transfusions. And importantly, in, of, of the patients enrolled on this study, uh, 38 of 106 actually re achieved a cytogenetic remission where that 5Q deletion uh, disappeared. And so this was early evidence that lenalidomide could be a useful therapy in patients with the 5Q deletion with MDS. Next, I'm going to talk about some principles in the higher-risk MDS. This is a second case. Uh, this is a woman who is 75 years old who was seen because of fevers and was diagnosed with pneumonia. Uh, she recovered with two days of inpatient antibiotics, followed by a one-week patient uh, outpatient course of antibiotics. And she was um, previously healthy except for a low thyroid that she took, for which she took supplementation. Um, the CBC in this patient had a white count of 1,200, so that's low. Uh, the absolute neutrophil count 
is much less than 1,000, which is considered neutropenic. So this patient had an ANC of 600. Hemoglobin was mildly low at 9.5. And again, the MCV was elevated. Platelets were 30,000. And so the patient has leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia. Uh, this patient's blood smear shows um, a nucleated red cell as well as a circulating blast or an immature cell. You can see that also the neutrophils that are important for fighting your infection appear dysplastic. And then finally, there's uh, no platelets in this picture, and so the platelet count uh, is lower than it should be. So this patient ended up having um, another bone, bone marrow aspirin and biopsy performed, and the pathologist read 12% blast, and so the diagnosis of MDS with excess blast was made. Cytogenetics showed a 45XX with a deletion 7 in 16 of 20 cells. And based on this deletion 7, which is a known high-risk cytogenetic finding, the IPSS revised score is 8.5, which confers very high risk. And so let's talk about treatment options for someone with high-risk MDS. For patients who are candidates for high-intensity treatment, um, we think about um, treating with a hypomethylating agent, so azacitidine or decitabine and then moving on to a donor or an allogeneic transplant. Um, if someone doesn't have a donor or is not a candidate for transplant, then we'll treat with a hypomethylating agent to try to reduce their risk of the complications from NMDS as well as their uh, transfusion requirements. For patients who are not candidates for intensive treatment, uh, we'll think about hypomethylating drugs uh, versus a clinical trial versus supportive care. And by supportive care, we mean transfusions of either red blood cells, platelets, or both as well as treating it for infections with antibiotics. Uh, the use of a drug called azacitidine is based on a publication in 2009 where patients with intermediate to or high-risk disease, again, based on the IPSS score, were randomized to this drug azacitidine versus conventional care. Conventional care was determined or defined to be either supportive care, low-dose cytarabine, or intensive chemotherapy. Uh, there are 358 patients enrolled in the trial, 179 in each arm, and this shows, again, that of the 358 patients who were enrolled, uh, the different therapies that they were assigned to if they were not randomized to the azacitidine. And so the majority who did not receive azacitidine received best supportive care. Some re received low-dose cytarabine, and a few received intensive chemotherapy. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve looking at the proportion uh, who were surviving in terms of months. So this x-axis shows about the two-year time mark here, and it shows that those who received azacitidine did better than those who were treated with conventional care. And so based on this, um, azacitidine was approved as a drug for the use of in patients in MDS. So generally speaking, um, patients who have lower risk disease, we observe not everybody with MDS diagnosis needs treatment. If someone's feeling well, they're not having any clinical signs or symptoms based on their relatively low counts, there's not necessarily a need to treat those patients. Some will receive growth factors, um, so filgrastim and EPO uh, to treat the white count and the hemoglobin. And these can also be given for time-limited uh, periods. I've had patients who had needed a surgical procedure or needed a temporary increase in their white count uh, to get them through an illness, we'll use filgrastim to support them through that, and then we can stop therapy safely. And then I mentioned the use of lenalidomide in the deletion 5Q uh, patients with um, MDS. Finally, higher risk disease, we think about these hypomethylating drugs, azacitidine or decitabine, uh, intensive chemotherapy, which is similar to some of the acute myeloleukemia induction regimens we use and the use of an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, I'm not going to talk in depth today about transplant because that's beyond the scope of our conversation today. I'm happy to try to answer questions as they come up, but a transplant is used thoughtfully. It's not necessarily a um, treatment of last resort in the treatment of MDS. For someone who's relatively young and healthy, we will use that um, as the modality to try to get them to and through uh, for potential cure. Finally, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of um, point mutations. And so these are molecular abnormalities that were relatively recently discovered in the early uh, 2010s um, by various groups around the country and around the world. 
but the hypothesis that really started this work was that there may be some mutations that influence prognosis that's not currently included in classification schemes. So you saw that when I talked about the IPSS and the revised IPSS scores, we talked a lot about cytogenetic abnormalities, but we didn't necessarily talk much about specific mutations that were seen um, in the DNA in these patients. And so these investigators, uh, as they published in the New England Journal in 2011, uh, collected samples from 439 patients who were treated at three centers between the years 94 and 2008. Uh, the IPSS scores at diagnosis and clinical course were known. Um, there were samples that were evaluated for 950 plus mutations in 111 genes, and they used a variety of techniques, including next generation sequencing and mass spectroscopy, excuse me, mass spectrometry based genotyping. And they looked at mutation status uh, and compared it with clinical variables and clinical outcomes. I'm not going to delve into this except to say that uh, these are different uh, mutations and this and these are different patients in the columns and it shows uh, that oftentimes um, the mutations that we're seeing don't overlap and so most patients ended up having just a couple of mutations if they had them at all. So to summarize some of these results, uh, there were mutations identified in 18 genes. Uh, about half of patients all had at least one point mutation and half of patients with normal karyotype had a point mutation. And again, looking at the IPSS revised score, uh, normal karyotype is actually thought to be a good risk factor. So it just shows that there's more than just karyotype that's important. In this paper, there were five genes that were independently predictive of a poor survival, including involvement with P53, which is involved in DNA repair and cell cycle arrest, uh, EZH2, uh, which is a gene expression silencer, ETV6, uh, which is important for hematopoiesis, as is RUNX1, and then finally ASXL1 encodes a chromatin binding protein. So all genes that are important in normal blood cell development, if they're abnormal, they can be associated with and causative for myelodysplastic syndrome. So the conclusions that these authors made were that somatic point mutations are common in myelodysplastic syndrome, and specific mutations predict poor survival independent of established risk factors. So this just set the stage for what is commonly uh, clinical and research practice at looking at different molecular abnormalities at diagnosis in patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. And this just kind of summarizes what I discussed with a few additions. So looking at uh, genes that are important in chromatin modification, ASXL1 and EZH2 are both thought to be poor risk. Uh, genes that are important in DNA methylation such as TET2, DNMT3A, IDH1, and IDH2 um, are important. Um, some are more clearly important than others. And then finally, some of the RNA splicing genes, SF3B1 uh, and so forth, are associated uh, with molecular uh, risk in myelodysplastic syndrome. So to conclude, um, I covered today some of the current MDS diagnostic criteria and naming conventions according to the 2016 World Health Organization update. Uh, I discussed the importance of the revised IPSS criteria that's used at risk assignment and diagnosis. So it's important if you or a family member are seeing your doctor about MDS uh, to have a sense of what is the IPSS revised score and what does it mean. Initial management uh, depends on whether the patient has low risk or high risk as determined by some of these scoring systems by molecular diagnostic, and just as importantly, what are the goals of care, and those need to be discussed at early visits. And then finally, molecular diagnostics are being incorporated to determine risk and to guide treatment. So with that, uh, that's my final slide. I'm happy to take questions, and um, this is my email address as well as my office number. If anyone wants to send me a note offline, I'd be happy to try to answer their questions. Great. Thank you very much for the uh, informative presentation. And we did have a few questions um, that have um, come in. So um, I'm going to answer this one myself because it pertains to um, the webinars at this time uh, cannot be downloaded and saved. However, you will be able to watch this webinar and other webinars that we've had um, on our online academy. And that email address is aa mds.org 
slash learn. Um, and this webinar will be available four to seven business days um, on our online academy. Um, so our first question um, is, uh, when the bone marrow sample is empty, uh, how is the scoring done? Sure, that's a good question. And so um, when the bone marrow sample is empty, and that happens from time to time, we think about one of two things. Uh, one, is it truly empty? Um, and maybe the, does the patient have aplastic anemia? In which case, uh, a lot of these risk stratification tools are not applicable directly to patients with a different bone marrow disorder called aplastic anemia. Or is there a uh, what are called patchy bone marrow samples, where there's some cell items um, in in one part of the bone marrow, but it's empty in the other? And so I think oftentimes what we'll do the first time is we'll try to resample uh, and get a couple of core biopsies to have a better sense of truly what's going on. Um, and if we do find some cellular elements, then we'll use the scoring system that I discussed uh, to fully re-stratify someone with MDS. But MDS and aplastic anemia do oftentimes behave similarly, and so it may be that uh, a patient who has an empty marrow has a different disorder called aplastic anemia. Okay, thank you. How successful are bone marrow transplants? The patient had a transplant from a twin sister. They were 100% compatible, and after a year and a half, the MDS has come back. Uh, the patient uh, was 68 at the time and is now back on Videza. Sure. So that's a, a good question, and it depends on a lot of different factors, and I probably won't be able to answer specifically in this case. Um, but things we look at are how well is the MDS controlled before the transplant. So optimally, we try to have the disease, you know, in quote-unquote remission as much as possible by using different medications that are FDA approved or study medications to try to get someone's MDS under good control. Um, and then when someone goes to transplant if the disease is under control, we talk about really three main risks. One, unfortunately, the biggest risk is that the MDS uh, may still come back even if uh, the transplant is successful in the short term. And that's really the biggest risk uh, down the road. The second is the risk of graft-versus-host disease, so developing an, pretty much an autoimmune condition that can happen uh, when a patient uh, takes on a new immune system from a donor. Um, and then the third risk is really what's called um, treatment-related complications, so opportunistic infections, uh, or other organ damage that can happen either around the time of the transplant or from complications of the transplant. Um, so, you know, they are successful, uh, certainly. They're not successful in, any, in everyone, unfortunately, and we are still, you know, actively as a community uh, researching different ways to help improve transplant outcomes, uh, including trying to reduce the relapse rates for the disease that's being transplanted. Great. Thank you. Um, how often are bone marrow biopsies done, and once you've been diagnosed with MDS, and when are the when are biopsies done after the patient's been diagnosed? Sure, that's a, a good question, and one we're asked oftentimes after the diagnostic marrow. Um, so bone marrow biopsies are done um, as often as they are helpful, and so by that I mean if someone is diagnosed with MDS and has fairly mild cytopenias and isn't requiring therapy, we'll often just follow the course of the disease based on peripheral blood counts uh, because bone marrow biopsies are very safe, uh, they're very helpful, um, but they can be uncomfortable and they may not necessarily always add clarity to what we're doing. My typical practice is if someone is being treated for their myelodysplastic syndrome, I will recommend a bone marrow biopsy anywhere from four to six months into their treatment. Um, to see if the bone marrow is responding appropriately, uh, and that helps to determine whether treatment's effective and whether we continue with the current treatment or whether we switch therapies and think about something different. Um, regarding patients who are uh, transplanted for myelodysplastic syndrome, we'll usually do a bone marrow biopsy about 30 days after the transplant, and then again about three months or at day 100 and then maybe again at the first year, even if their um, blood counts look okay, just to make sure that things are engrafting as we expected. Um, and then finally, I think it has to be mentioned, with patients on clinical trials, sometimes there are bone marrow aspirates and biopsies that are part of the study protocol that helps us understand how the bone marrow is reacting to or responding to newer treatments. And so if someone's on a clinical trial, 
they may have bone marrows that are done at different schedules or maybe more often than would be um, done for someone who's not in a clinical study. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a question regarding uh, chromosome deletions. Uh, can you speak to deletions? I believe this is for a 15 and 6 uh, with very low platelets. Sure. I would have to look this up myself to know okay. for sure off the top of my head. So it's a fair question. Um, I think it's something, though, that um, the person's clinician could certainly give them more information about this subtype. And I'll say this, there are certainly some common deletions, common additions, and common translocations that we know a lot about. Um, and oftentimes the pathologist will even say in their report that a certain uh, chromosome involvement has either never been reported or hasn't been reported in numbers large enough to really make clinical decisions based on. And so I think working with uh, your doctor would be would be the next step regarding that. Okay. Uh, the patient actually responded saying um, that they have a gain in 15 and 6. Okay. Can you can okay. you speak to that? Is that? Again, not off okay. the top of my head. I'd have to look okay. it up. So, but I'm happy okay. to have her send me a note, and I can kind of steer her towards some more specific okay. resources. Great. I'll, what I'll do is offline, I'll get you and, and the patient Sure. Um, connected by email. So thank you very much. Um, Sounds good. Um, why was CMML uh, removed from the IPSS? So s chronic my myelomonocytic leukemia was um, shown to behave in different ways than, than regular MDS. And so when the World Health Organization convened this working group, uh, they found that <clears throat> the outcomes for patients with CMML weren't necessarily better or worse. They were just different based on other risk factors. And so a lot of the um, prognostic criteria weren't relevant for those patients, and so they moved the category to something different. Okay, thank you. Um, hypomethylating agents, are they chemotherapy? Or, and if not, what's the difference between a hypomethylating agent and chemotherapy? Sure. That's a good question and one I'm asked oftentimes in clinic. You know, are these drugs azacitidine and decidabine considered to be chemotherapy or not? I would say yes, they are. Uh, they are chemotherapy drugs uh, that are given either through an IV or subcutaneously under the skin, depending on the specific drug and depending on the uh, dosing schedule. Um, but that being said, they're not given in high, high doses like we think about other chemotherapies for either other blood cancers or other solid tumors. And the way they work, it's thought that uh, they kind of reprogram the cells and they can help the cells develop more normally uh, than they have been. So this hypomethylating name comes from um, removing methyl groups that are important in gene expression. Uh, that's a basis for the development of why patients have MDS. And so from a practical standpoint, they're drugs that are injected, but they're not um, often causing things like hair loss or significant nausea, vomiting, uh, that higher doses of chemotherapy can can have. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Um, once a patient received their their IP, IPSS score, um, how do doctors decide, along with the patient, which treatment is best to use, specifically Videza versus Dacogen? Right. So that specific question is one that's not answered to my knowledge. It's um, There's never been a head-to-head -head comparison between those two medications. So I would answer that more broadly. I would look at, you know, what are the, the goals of care for the patient? Um, how is their health coming into this? How is their myelodysplastic syndrome affecting their life? And just walking through the different treatment options and trying to figure out, will treatment um, make a patient feel better? Will treatment delay uh, complications of MDS that would happen if left untreated? And again, the, I think one of the core conversations that we have early on in the treatment course is, is the role of transplant. Is this someone who's a transplant candidate or not? And what can we do to get them there as safely as possible? Oh, okay. So is there a difference? But as far as the dacogen between the... So I guess practically speaking, the, the FDA label for azacitidine is it's a given seven days in a row okay. it can be given either IV or subcutaneously, uh, whereas decidabine or dacogen is given either five days or 10 days in a row, and it's given only through an IV. It can't be given subcutaneously. And so okay. different practices around the country and different academic groups kind of have a preference for one or the other.
Okay. But uh, essentially, they work very similarly. And when I counsel patients, you know, I'll say that the side effects are generally about the same. Okay, thank you. Is Revlimid sure. used outside of treating patients um, besides those that are diagnosed with 5Q? Right. So the short answer is yes. Um, lenalidomide can be used in patients um, safely who have low-risk myelodysplastic syndrome even without the 5Q deletion. Uh, I believe the FDA label, though, requires the 5Q deletion, but there's good clinical trial evidence that it can be efficacious in patients without deletion 5Q. And sometimes it's just a matter of working with the clinician who works with the pharmacist who works with the insurer to get coverage for that medication if there's no 5Q involvement. Okay, thank you. And our last question is, what is one or two takeaways that you think patients should get from um, knowing their IPSSR score? So I think the, knowing the IPSS score is important for realistic conversations about you know what likely could happen in the next X amount of time. You know, is this going to be a disease that's going to be rapidly progressive um, and facing some potentially end-of-life conversations soon, or is this a slow, uh, slowly developing disease that there may be a number of options that are available over the upcoming years for a patient who might not progress quickly? I think it just helps set the tone for expectations, um, for realistic treatment planning, and also hope in, in whether it's a low-risk disease or high-risk disease talking about um, goals of care and working with the clinician, working with family members to be sure that everyone's on the same page about eliciting a patient's goals and values and having um, some important and sometimes some difficult conversations, but ones that are ultimately done best when all the information is available. Great. Thank you. And are there any questions that your patients ask you um, that you think the um, participants would like to know about? Sure. I think one commonly asked question, and I'm still not quite sure the best way to answer it, is, um, you know, so I'm told I have myelodysplastic syndrome. I'm told I have MDS. Do I have cancer? And I would say that, um, you know, it's a serious blood disorder. Um, it has a lot of the features that cancers have and that there's uh, cells that are not growing and developing normally. Um, but it's not a cancer in terms of there's no mass or lump or tumor that we have to try to uh, treat either surgically or with radiation. Um, but it is similar to blood cancers in a lot of ways in that patients uh, face potential therapies that have side effects. And um, depending on how aggressive the MDS is, you know, it could potentially be very aggressive and um, really impact someone's life. So I don't think I even answered the question by saying that, but that's a fair question that I get uh, not infrequently. You know, is this a cancer or not? Great. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for everyone uh, for joining us today and submitting your questions. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each of you for joining us today and making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help at aamds.org so that we can respond or you can also visit our online academy for interviews with experts which may also address your questions. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear uh, on your screen. Please do take time to complete the survey. Uh, we really do value your input and in helping us uh, with better programming. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.